Well, good morning, everybody over at the warehouse and the fire hall. Our friends up in Churchill, we're praying for you, and uh, we continue to support you. Everybody joining us online and on iTunes, uh, great to have you join us as well. Hey, this is the end of our IF series, and who knew that two little letters, I and F, put together could create such shock and such possibility and such potential. And we've been discovering that all summer long, and we're going to continue to discover that in our last installment, which is today. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you remember what kind of TV you had when you were a kid? Now, a bunch of you are kids, so you're like, yeah, I got a 65-inch LED, right? I mean, when I was a kid, we had a 14-inch black and white that looked exactly like this. In fact, that was our TV right there. But it was amazing. It was amazing when I was a kid. It beamed into our house three channels, two English and a French. It was, it was incredible. And, and my brother and I, when we were little kids, we would do really crazy things with this thing. I mean, one day, we, we took, and we took the TV off of its octagon sort of little end table, and we took it, and we put it on the floor. Yeah, I know. And we got our cereal, and we, got our, we put our heads in our hands, and we watched Saturday morning cartoons. And then my mom would walk in, and she'd say, you know, she'd say, whoa, you're way too close. You're, you're like a yard and a half from the TV. You're going to go blind having a screen that close to your eyes. Nobody should ever have a screen that close to their eyes. And then we'd move back a little bit further, and, and it was great. And then we got a little bit older, and, and we did even crazier things with this TV. We unplugged it and took it downstairs. I know, I know, it's shocking, but we would go downstairs, and we'd have our cereal, and we would watch cartoons downstairs. Now, my mom and dad were okay with cartoons, but they drew a line with stampede wrestling. No stampede wrestling allowed in our house. However, kids, close your ears, don't listen to what your pastor did, okay? I found a way around this. I found that if I left the TV in the basement in the morning and didn't take it back up, later in the afternoon on Saturdays, I could sneak back downstairs and I could watch Stampede Wrestling without anybody knowing. Now, I loved Stampede Wrestling. It was awesome. I mean, you had these guys in masks, and they would do this wrestling match. But the singles one-on-one, -on -one, that was a little boring for me, right? I mean, because they would have to pace their energy, and it was sort of, you know, kind of getting the same. There was no, no real huge surprises. But what I loved to watch was tag team. Tag team wrestling was where it was at. I couldn't wait until tag team. I just hoped my mom hadn't walked downstairs to, to shut me down from watching tag team. And there you, there you had the dynamite kid getting just pounced on by Tiger Face, right? Or you had Killer Kowalski. You know, uh, he, he's just taking on Abdullah, the, you know, the, the killer or whatever his name was. I mean, these guys were amazing tag team. The way the tag team worked was that they, one wrestler would be in the ring and they would give it everything they had. And then they would get exhausted or they'd get just annihilated and they would try and crawl their way over, over to the ropes, right? And they're just like, there's nothing left of them. And then they would get over to the ropes and then they would tag and they would tag off with the next person. Then they'd come in with fresh energy and it was great. So I was thinking about this the other day. I thought, well, you know, it's a long weekend. Maybe we could have some fun. What would happen if we did tag team preaching? I thought this would be great. Now, when you're in a wrestling match, okay, it's not all quiet, is it? The wrestling matches aren't quiet. They're noisy places. And I know this isn't Riverwood style, but it's a long weekend. We can be different. Who cares, right? So let me practice this with me, okay? All right? Just after me. Preach it. Preach it. Okay, see, that's, that's what you would hear. You wouldn't hear preach it at the wrestling match, but you'd hear, you would hear, you'd hear a callback like that, right? You know, or, or something like, ooh, so good. Ooh. Amen. Amen. Boo, you suck. No, 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 we're not going to. We're not going to do boo, you suck this morning, okay? We're not going to do that. But if you feel that, that you hear anything that you want to call back, you know, if, if you find that one of us is struggling a bit, we're getting a little lost, and we're, you, we need some encouragement, encourage us. We're going to have some fun this morning, okay? You get to participate because we are going to preach this morning tag team style. Yeah, awesome. So kids, I need your attention right now because you guys are going to play a very important role in this next part of our message. What I need you to do is I need you to help all of these adults get up on their feet because we're going to pray together. So can everyone join me and let's all stand together as we pray. So kids, get those, get your parents up, get us all standing and let's pray together before we start our message. God, we thank you for this opportunity that we have as a family to all come together and take in your word to learn what you have planned for us. I pray for this message, that every person listening to this message will be impacted by it, that their hearts will be changed and turned towards you because of the words spoken from this platform. 
And I pray that for us as a team, the words that we speak would be yours. God, we love you. We give this whole message to you. Amen. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So, um, like Todd said, we're going to need some of your cheering. And I am, for one, I'm going to love and appreciate it. Um, first, thank you, but first I want to ask you a, a little question. Have you ever thought what it would be like to be on a desert island? Okay, well just think for a moment. Picture yourself there, but before you go, you get to make a choice of just one thing that you get to take with you. And if you just think for a moment, what would one thing be? Just one. In 1941, there was a freelance radio broadcaster. His name was Roy Plomley. And he was staying up one evening late in his pajamas when he had this really amazing thought about a radio show. And it was really simple, really. He would just need to interview some really familiar personalities and ask them just one question. And that question was this. If you were stranded on a desert island, what one music album would you take with you? And that's an interesting question, and, and you'd really have to think a little bit about this because, first of all, the island would need to have a record player for them, and also a power source. But guess what? The producers and the listeners, they all love this idea. Over 3,000 personalities have been interviewed on this program. It's called Desert Island Discs. And different people like, you may have heard of Tom Hanks, Ed Sheeran, um, Bruce Springsteen, what about a jazz great like Louis, Ar Louis Armstrong, Tennis Williams, he was a playwright, also David Beckham, Bob Hope, Margaret Atwood for the readers out there. You know, this has been going on for 76 years, but isn't this an interesting question? Even if you've never thought about it before, just take a second and think. Out of everything that you have of your possessions, and you had to whittle it down to just one thing, and not even stop there, but what about the thousands or millions of options that you have? What would you take to this desert island on your own? So I thought about it, and I had thought at first, oh, automatically my family, but we're a family of five plus a dog, so that doesn't work. So I thought, well, if I could bring one kid with me at least, I would love that. But then, okay, I'm one of those women, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, and. I don't like cooking, I don't like it at all, and I don't sew. So I thought, Dale, if any of you know my husband, Dale, he can do it all. He cooks, he sews, okay, not quite all, he doesn't clean, but that's okay, because we'd be on an island, done. But, you know, when I think about in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul was asked the same question. Just imagine him being interviewed with a microphone in front of his face, and he was asked this one question, what is the most important thing that you would take with you? I think if Paul was asked this question, I believe he would say, if I was stuck on a desert island, the one thing that I would bring with me is the gospel. And I know from the start, that seems kind of extra. That seems overly spiritual, overly religious. Like, why are you saying that? That's, that's a bit of a try-hard statement. But check out what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 4. He writes to a group of Christians in the city of Corinth. They are the Corinthians. And check out what he writes to them. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Paul says, if I was stuck on a desert island, the one thing I would bring with me is the gospel, the word of God. Because for Paul, he had been so deeply impacted by this gospel, this message of, of Jesus dying for our sins, that it became his everything. It became his focus in life. He gave everything to it. It was his mandate, his mission. It was everything. It became his oxygen. It became his lifeline. And he didn't just need to hear it once. He needed it every single day. He needed it on a regular basis. 
And so if he was asked this question, I believe he would say, I would take the gospel because it was so important to him. It became of first importance. But Paul wasn't always this way. Paul, actually, when the church began to spread, he stood in opposition to the church. Paul hated Christians. Paul hated believers. He hated Jesus, and he hated the church. And he gave his life to destroying it, to shutting it down, to eliminating this gospel message. He went around having Christians tried and thrown into prison. He had them murdered on some occasions. He hated them with a passion. And so one day, he's on his way to uh, a, another city a, a little ways off from where he was. He had heard that there was this group of believers there spreading the gospel, and people are believing this message, and things are happening, and he's like, I'm going to put an end to this. So he's on his way to this place, and as he's on this road, he has an encounter, this weird moment with none other than Jesus. And he realizes in this moment, what was I doing? This person, this Jesus who I was opposing was in fact the truth. He is real and he realized that Jesus was his Lord and Jesus was his Savior. As he stood in, on this road with Jesus, the living God, he realized that he was a sinner, that he was broken and that he desperately needed a Savior. He was separated from God but he realized in this moment that Jesus was his reconciliation. Jesus was his redemption. That God the Father had sent Jesus when no one else could repair the relationship between God and humans. God the Father had sent Jesus and Jesus lived a perfect and sinless life and then he was betrayed by the very people that he came to save he was uh, put on an, an illegal trial and he was condemned to death then he was mocked and and beaten and tortured and eventually he would be murdered on a cross he would be taken off of that cross and put into a tomb this giant stone would be rolled away so they would keep him inside but a few days later a couple of Jesus's friends came to that tomb and the rock was rolled away they looked inside and Jesus wasn't there and Paul realized that the reason he wasn't there is because he was walking around talking to people letting them know that he had in fact beat death and he was victorious over sin and the grave Paul realizes this in this moment that everything he was fighting against was the truth and so he switches his life does a 180 and he decides that he's going to give even more effort to opposing the church than to build the church this message became everything for Paul it became everything for him it, be it became of first importance and Paul writes to the Corinthians and, and he writes to us today that he wants the gospel in our lives to be of first importance. Thank you, buddy. All right. Amen. I love that. I love the clarity. I mean, when I was thinking about this question, I thought duct tape, right? I mean, don't tell Caroline. I didn't even think of her. I thought duct tape. It, it, was, it was a bad moment. Dale was a much better choice for you. But, but here Paul is. What would you take? If you had one thing to take, what would you take? He just grabs the mic and says, first importance, I take the gospel. Mic drop. Boom. There it is. He just says, that's how it's going to be. But I don't know if you noticed this or not, there's an if in that passage. This is the last if we're going to look at, and it's a shocking if. Do you know why? Because it messes with our idea of salvation. Just about every one of us that has faith in Jesus Christ has a salvation idea that came from the 1830s to the 1890s. Did you know that? Did you know your idea of salvation isn't necessarily biblical? It's much more 1830s to 1890s. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, do, do any of these names uh, spark anything in you? Charles Finney. Do you know Charles Finney? Or maybe uh, D.L. Moody or Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday was something else. Billy Sunday was one of these preachers that he was actually a professional athlete turned celebrity preacher. He would often climb on top of the pulpit. Imagine if I climbed on top of this, this table, and he would just give it to the people. I mean, he would, just, he would give it with everything, and they loved it. They loved what, what he was given. But these people, Finney, Dwight Moody, um, uh, the, the Booths, uh, William and Catherine Booth, I mean, all these preachers, they would come out, and they were doing something that hadn't been done for 1,800 years. They were trying to move people to a point of decision in their meetings right then so that they would get saved right there. That was a new way of thinking. And, and so what they did is they got these tents, and they would have these great big tent meetings, and they would set up in a farmer's field, and they'd have all these chairs, and it would be muddy, so they'd put sawdust down for an aisle, and they'd get in there, and they would preach their guts out. But their aim was to get people saved that moment. That was new. That was a new thought on salvation. So what you ended up having was Charles Finney. He had something in the front called the anxious seat or the anxious bench. All right? Can you imagine if we had an anxious bench here, a little sign, anxious bench, right over here? And, and the way it worked was, uh, are you a sinner? Are you far from God? Are you somebody who needs Jesus? Do you have problems in your life? Here's what I want you to do. Come and sit on the anxious bench so we can all see you. 
and we can pray for you, and you can pray, and you can accept Jesus. That was, that was, that'd be kind of weird, hey? D.L. Moody and, and uh, Billy Sunday, though, they softened it up with something called the altar call. You ever hear of an altar call? The altar call. It was also known as, as, as hiking or walking the sawdust trail, hitting the sawdust trail, people called it. And what it was was at the end of the message, they'd say, you want salvation? You want to come and be saved? Come down this sawdust trail to the front where you can all stand here and put up your hand and pray the prayer. Pray the prayer. So many of us have this idea that salvation is a moment in time that happened in our past. So for me, I've always walked around thinking salvation. Salvation was when I was six years old. In my basement, we had a Bible club called the Backyard Bible Club. I could never figure out why it was in our basement, but it was a Backyard Bible Club in our basement. And this old lady with gray hair told me the story of Jesus, and something in my heart at six years old realized that I needed Jesus. And I'll never forget kneeling down on this wooden bench, beside this wooden bench with Mrs. Owen. And she knelt down beside me, and I accepted Jesus into my life. And that is my idea of salvation. Salvation happened when I was six years old, and that's, that's salvation. Paul, though, with this verse, says, I'm going to mess with your idea of salvation because I, salvation is not a moment in time when you raised your hand, when you walked down the aisle, when you went to the altar call, when you knelt down with Mrs. Owen to receive Christ. That's not salvation, he says. And this messes with us. Did you see this? Did you see the if here? And by which you are being saved... You could continue to be saved by in which you are being saved if, if, if you hold fast to the word I preached you, unless you believed in vain. He is messing us up when it comes to timing, big time on this one. Because he is saying, listen, salvation isn't some moment in time 20 or 30 years ago that happened in about four minutes, and that's your salvation. He is saying you are being saved continually, daily. Daily you need to be saved, and you are being saved daily if you hold fast to my message of the gospel. You hold fast to the word of God. You are being saved daily if you hold fast to the word of God. But we have a problem. We have a problem when it comes to the word of God in this day and age. We have a bunch of problems. But one of the problems is that we don't know the word. And that is a huge problem for us today. And as I was thinking about this, I was, why don't we know the word? Why, why aren't we reading the Bible? And we come to so many reasons, so many excuses, and we're going to have about 10 listed. There's a lot more, and you're going to come up with some of your own. But the first one that I want to talk about that is very familiar to most of us is that we don't have time. We don't have time. It could be because we're too busy in ministry. You might think that's a good thing, but it's not if you're not taking time in the Word. You might be too busy taking your kids to all the extracurricular activities. That's a hard one, too, in our world, because you want to put your kid in everything. But, you, but we got to make time for what... Thanks. But being in the Word, I'm preaching to myself, too. I'm telling, narrowing it down to my kids. What are we choosing? And so these are things that we need to really think about. In Luke chapter 10, we see when Jesus goes to Mary and Martha's home. And Mary is so stoked. Well, I think Martha is too, but Mary just can't help herself. She's there, and she's just listening to the words that are coming out of his mouth, and she is loving it, and she just can't get enough. And Jesus is loving it back. And Martha, she's busy getting everything ready. There's so much to do, and she, it's not that what she's doing is wrong, but she's not making time for the priority. I don't know if any of you have gotten your kids to do some chores, and there's one that's Mom, Dad, so-and-so's not cleaning up. I'm doing more than they are. It happens in my house all the time. And you know what? I think Martha just kind of started building up this angst in her, and she has the goal to actually tell Jesus what to do. Tell Mary to get off there and start helping me out. And you know what? Jesus kind of disagreed with Martha. He said, don't take this. I won't take this away from, from Mary and so I just think that we need to think a little bit more about our priorities. It's not that the things that we do are bad, but we're really, really taking something away 
from why we're here and, and even what God wants to speak to us in, in certain moments of our day to help us get through those seasons that we're in, if we would just take time and maybe give one thing up this season and give it to God, even just for 15 minutes a day. One that I think is a little more acceptable in my mind is I don't know where to start. There's so many of us where we've been away from reading the Bible for a while and just like, okay, God, you know what? I want to hear from you. I'm just going to, and we blindly open it up. And that's where it brings us to number three. The Bible is too confusing. Sometimes you open it up and you're just like, some of us has been like, I got a word. I just opened it up and it was there. And wow, God spoke to me. And other people, it's been devastating. You know, it takes me back to a time in my small group. We were doing the Alpha series, and we were having a discussion about the Word of God, and one of the group members was really, like, it wasn't even just a quick ask. There was, like, some severity in her voice of, okay, you guys, I have something to ask you. If God is love, then why, when I read from this passage, I just decided that I wanted God in my life, and I started to read, and I just picked a passage, and she said, I was so disturbed, I actually had nightmares, and I didn't want to look at it again because I was afraid of what was going to be said next. I mean, there was murder in this, there was rape, and none of those things are happy things. And nor do you feel like that's what Jesus wanted to bless you with. So none of us actually had the answer for her that day, and we've all been Christians pretty much our whole life. So we actually had to humble ourselves a bit and say, you know what, we don't have the answer for you right now. But why don't we each get into that passage during the week, dig a little deeper, and when we come back next week, before we start our regular study on Alpha, we're going to talk about this passage. And you know what? This small group night happened on a night that I did not want to get together. I was actually hoping that people would call to say they wouldn't show up that night. I know this is such an embarrassing thing to say as a small group's director. But at the same time, we all have this reality where we're tired. And you know what? We grew that night. We, we actually were able to, in the next week that we got together, really know what God was saying out of that passage, and we had peace, and it wasn't such a scary thing. What about number four, where I might have to change? This can be tough for me. I'm a very sensitive person, and... Um, you know, sometimes hurts happen when you're overly sensitive. And I remember reading and God telling me about, talking to me about needing to forgive. And I'm like, but they didn't apologize yet. You know, they need to know I'm hurting. But at the same time, you keep reading further. And it's, again, this forgiveness thing. And you've got to let it go. How many of us have things that when we read and then it's kind of a harsh thing, hard to look at? Well, Bill Hybels has an interesting quote about this. And I'd like to share it with you. It's not the things I don't understand about the Bible that bother me. It's the things I do understand with perfect clarity and don't comply with that to keep me up at night. You know, we see these things, and it, it sometimes makes us not want to go to the Word of God because we know that it means we need to change. Um, number five, to some of us, the Bible's optional. I mean, we get a great teaching each weekend. We can watch it on TV. We can even be on Facebook and get our little verse of the day. But if we're not looking carefully at what we're reading, what came before that verse? What comes after? We sometimes don't even know what the real meaning is, and that can actually be dangerous and not okay for us to actually do that. So I would like to share with you, there was a man whose um, his wife was in the military, and she would send him letters in the mail. This was pre-internet days. So, but this just made me think about, wow, it is so important for us to read the whole story. Here we go. Years ago, my wife was deployed in the military for months. She would send me letters pre-internet days. When I received them, I'd read through quickly, then sit back and think. Then I would read through and examine patterns why did she write so neatly here, but more hurriedly here? What's going on? Why are there hearts on these exclamation points, but not these? Then I would read through it slowly. I'd walk around thinking about it. Why did I do this? Because I loved my wife. Suppose it was different, though. Suppose I got the letter, and I just tossed it over on the pile of other mail. And there it sat with the junk mail and bills for a few days. I'd walk across the room, and I'd see it. 
But instead of opening it up, I would just ignore it as I would watch Sports Center or read the paper. You would doubtless call me a bad husband and say that our relationship was in trouble. You would be right. But isn't this what people do with the Bible? God has spoken to us in the Word of God. It is a letter to us. How can a person say that they truly love God, but throw this letter aside in favor of other stuff? How can they give it less attention than to things that don't matter? Let's be honest. If you don't read your Bible, it is because you don't want to read your Bible. And to bottom line this further, this is indicative of your relationship with God. We cannot separate a love for the Word of God and the God of the Word. That's hard. It sounds, when I first read that, I thought, he's being kind of mean. And I actually almost didn't want to read that part to you. But you know, it's true. What We make time for the things that matter. So if we're not reading our Bible, I'm pointing at me too. So that way I don't get hate letters. But it's just, that means we just really don't want to. And it comes down to that. Number six. Many church leaders don't expect us to read the Bible. Now, I'm not saying that of us here because you know what? Pastor Todd's been working at this. I remember, I don't know if any of you were here for Route 66. I mean, we've been pushing this. And now, um, as Lawrence had talked about earlier, we're going to be doing the story. We have the opportunity to go through the Bible together from kids to adults. We get to do this together. And we get to know the, what came before, what came after. And I just want to encourage everybody, especially for someone who's been away from reading the Bible for quite a while, or maybe you're new or you're bringing someone new, don't do this alone. Don't make it confusing. Don't make it harder than what it has to be. Just remember my story about my small group? Well, I want to encourage everybody here. If you're not in a small group, you need to get into one. It's the perfect timing. And I give absolutely every single person permission here to be a little bit odd and ask someone as you pass them by, are you in a small group? It's going to be so good for everybody. Get together with two people, three people, six people. I don't care. And if you don't know how to get into a group and you're a little more on the shy side, well, guess what? The essential teaming and training that we do for our support coaches and our small group leaders that are already doing their work right now, I'm inviting you September 17th from 6.30 to 8.30. We're going to have dinner and dessert, and we're going to make a way for you to get into a small group. Or maybe some of you are like, you know what, I need to lead this kind of group. We're going to help you do that as well. So this is really important that we understand that when we come together and we do this, that we get everything in there so we can understand what the letter is to us, what Jesus is actually saying. Number seven, Google faith. We can all Google a Bible verse. I do it. We also have our Bible apps on our phone, and these are good. So if we can get God's word so easily now, why is Bible reading or Bible engagement on the decline? It just doesn't make sense. So I love that we are going to be doing this as a church together this year. Google faith, then we go to failure. You know, some people tried doing the 365-day read and, and failed and tried doing other things and maybe you last for two weeks and then you peter off. Well, get into a group. Get a buddy to do this with you. Just think, as a whole church, we're all reading the same passages at the same time. We get together in our small group. We get to share what we had in our quiet time with God in the Word. And then imagine what the buzz will be like when we come to church on the weekend. It'll change everything. It'll be so different. Number nine, sometimes there's some Bible bullies out there, and they want to make some of us feel like we haven't studied long enough, we can't understand anything in there. Um, just kind of make you feel a little insecure about even voicing your opinion, even in a small group. But you know what? Don't let that happen because we have such a loving pastoral team here that is actually so excited about doing the story together. And we get to go through this. That means if something's confusing, that's okay. We're going to talk about it and we're going to grow and we're going to actually get the story straight, as Pastor Todd says. Um, the last one, number 10, Paul predicted you wouldn't read it. So I'm just going to read a, a verse in Timothy. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, 
But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. So he didn't exactly predict that you and I wouldn't read our Bibles anymore. But he did predict that many of us would find more entertaining alternatives. And I do see that now. And my hope is that everyone here will get excited. Can I hear an amen about getting excited about the word? Amen. All right, let's do this. Uh, awesome. Uh, that was a weak high five on my part. As Michelle said, there are those who don't know the word, but there are also those who stop believing the word. Church, how do you feel about sharks? Do you quiver in your boots and hear the iconic G Jaws theme song playing in the back of your mind whenever you hear the word shark? Or do you anxiously wait for the Discovery Channel Shark Week every year? Well, if you do, then you might have thought, oh, sharks have to continually move through water so that they can breathe. Well, I learned this week that it's actually not true. There's a small group of sharks called obligate ram ventilators, and they're the sharks that have to move through water so they can continue to breathe. And what they need to do is constantly swim. When, when they're sleeping, when they're resting, they always have to move forward so that water will flow over their gills, and then they can take in oxygen. And you know what? The gospel is the oxygen that flows past the gills of our souls. We have to constantly be taking it in. Paul says to the Corinthians that they're obligate ram ventilators. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. And the phrase that stuck out to me in this passage was the phrase hold fast. And so I looked at the original Greek and wanted to know what, what was the language for hold fast? What was the word? And the word in Greek for hold fast is katecho. And this word uses the imagery of keeping a ship on its correct path. And so what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, what he's saying to us, is keep the ship on the correct course. Remember the goal and don't get distracted from the destination and the direction. And I believe that so often we allow ourselves to drift from the path of the gospel. We believe that because we vote for this pol political party and not that one, or because we send our kids to this school and not that one, or because we stand on this side of the controversy, that we still believe. But at our core, we've drifted. And what we must always remember is to keep our gaze transfixed on the image and the person of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us because out of that, the rest of our life flows. Then there are those who stop believing because they allow themselves to be distracted from the gospel. They allow lesser endeavors to take a hold of their attention. We can allow other voices, other messages, influences outside of what we know to be true to distract our attention from Jesus. And when we allow ourselves to get distracted, we drift from that path of faith. And you know what, church? All of us are susceptible to distraction. Even those of us that have walked the path of faith for many years can still become distracted. And so as believers, we must never become so familiar with the gospel that we allow ourselves to be distracted from it. And sometimes we stop believing in the midst of disaster. We allow pain and anger and grief to cloud out that gospel message. And this pain removes our gaze from the gospel of Jesus. And when we believe that the gospel, the good news, can be anything but perfectly good, we have lost sight of the destination and the direction that Paul tells us to hold fast to. Church, the crises of life are so real. But it is in that crisis that we need most to remember that the gospel, the fact that Jesus came and died for our sins, defeated death in the grave, and was raised to new life, was so that we could have life. You need to always remember 
even in disaster, to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. I love how author and pastor Bobby Houston says this. She says, we're all on a journey through life, every man, woman, and child. This journey is so important because it's leading to a destination which is eternal, and therefore it's not some haphazard reality. It's actually critical to the well-being of the individual human soul. The journey we are on is critical, and the gospel needs to be central to our life journey. We need to stay committed to the gospel message above all else. Paul says to hold fast to the word. That word is the gospel. And if a shark that's an obligate ram ventilator gets, stops moving through the water, it dies. If you want to keep a ship on the correct path, you always need to be keeping the destination in mind. And so we need to always have the gospel in front of us, leading and guiding us onward. It's actually so critical. It is the most critical. So get the gospel in front of you. Write it down. Read it often. Repeat it to yourself. Take time to evaluate your faith. Is your life demonstrating that you are committed to the path of the gospel? In your heart and in your soul, are you connecting with God every day? Is the finished work of Jesus affecting how you choose to live each day? And if it's not, then what needs to change? Church, we must always endeavor to stay fully committed to the gospel. In a difficult time in my life, I had just been diagnosed with anxiety and depression. I struggled and I wrestled with my faith. Because you know what? I would read verses and I would sing worship songs that talked about freedom and I didn't feel free. And one day, while reading God's word during my personal devotions, I was reading Isaiah chapter 43 and verses 18 and 19 of that pas passage struck me. And they say, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This gospel truth washed over my soul like fresh oxygen. It breathed fresh life into my spirit and helped me to stay on that path of faith. Church, the gospel is still good news. It's still the gospel. And if you've fallen away from that path of faith, if you've, become, if you've drifted, if you've become distracted, if you've allowed disaster to cloud out the gospel, come back. It's not too late. Jesus is waiting with open arms to welcome you back to that path of faith. Remember that the gospel is the very oxygen for your soul. Man, these guys are preaching. So good. So, we have those who don't know the word. We have those who stop believing the word. And finally, we have those who uh, believe a false word. Have you ever found yourself in a situation, you're in a group of people, uh, you, maybe you're at your, a party, you're at a gathering, or you're in a small group, and everyone starts having these little side conversations, like everyone kind of, you're in a conversation it, with just one person. You like this person, and you start talking about things that you like. So you're pumped about this conversation, you're into it, you're focused, you're like listening to what they're saying, and then you're responding and you're having a good time. And then all of a sudden, someone who's having a side conversation, they're talking, you don't even hear them, you forget that they're even in the room. All of a sudden, they say one word, and all of a sudden, it catches your attention, it perks your ears, and you're like, oh, what, what did they say, Kim Kardashian? What's that about, Kim Kardashian? And, and all of a sudden, your, your, your attention is taken away from your previous conversation. You realize that, you're like, oh, I need to focus, and so you try to get back into your conversation, but you're still kind of like half in each, you're like half listening to them, you're like kind of mindlessly nodding, you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, but you're also listening to this other conversation, and you just want to know what they're talking about, and then you eventually get to this point where you're like, I don't even care what this person is saying anymore, like all you want to, for it for is this conversation to end, because they said Kim Kardashian, and you love Kim Kardashian for some reason, and you want to talk about that now or whatever it is that they're talking about. But you just can't wait for this conversation to end. You're like, oh, thank God. And you're like, okay, bye. And you go to this new conversation. Has that ever happened to you? It happens to me quite often. I get distracted. And, and I think sometimes that this happens with us in the word of God. 
We're so focused on the word of God. We're like, God, I want to hear from you. I want to know what you're saying. I want to know what your word says. I want you to speak to me. I want to be in your presence. I want to have my quiet time, my devotional time. I want God to speak to me like he spoke to Zach. And then all of a sudden, we hear this uh, new idea. This We're watching Oprah, and this happens, and, and, and Dr. Phil says this, and Dr. Us says that. And, and all these voices, we hear them, and we get distracted, and we're focused. But then all of a sudden, we hear something, and we're like, ah, oh, I kind of like how that sounds. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Oh, wow, that's interesting. And before we know it, if we're not careful, we can actually end up believing a false word. We can allow the latest uh, cultural idea, the latest pop culture trend, the latest uh, fad or, or topic to work its way into our worldview, our theology. And it can actually, if we're not careful, pull us away from what God wants for us. And we end up actually, in some cases, trivializing scripture. This is what happens to the Corinthians. This is why Paul wrote chapter 15 uh, of 1 Corinthians. See, what happened was he went to the city of Corinth. He started preaching the gospel. And these people were like, yeah, I want that. That sounds amazing. Jesus, give me Jesus. And so he teaches them, and then he leaves them because they're, they're good to go on their own. Paul leaves to go plant other churches and, and build into other leaders. But he leaves, and something happens. This, this person comes along and says, hey, do you realize that what Paul told you wasn't true? And they, he, he tells them, Jesus didn't actually resurrect from the grave. He didn't rise from the dead. And they're like, oh, yeah, we thought that was kind of strange. You're like rising from the dead. Oh, what's that all about? And they're like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, what you just said. Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And it actually caused them to uh, adjust the way they lived. It, it, it impacted their lives as they believed this. And so Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians 15 to be like, guys, listen, that's a false word. That's not actually true. What I preached to you was true. Jesus did resurrect from the grave. And they're like, oh, okay, well, now we believe that again. It's actually quite easy to believe a false word. And we, like the Corinthians, are susceptible to these false words. Words like God and, or, or Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha are all homies. They're just hanging out together, and it doesn't matter what you believe. You can just pick and choose. Or that all religions lead to the same path and you can just pick one. It doesn't matter. Or pick five and combine them. It, do, it, it doesn't matter. Things like God is this angry guy just kind of in the sky waiting to punish us whenever we do something he doesn't like. Words or, or things like um, we can just pick and choose scripture. Oh, that one challenges you? Oh, you don't like that? Oh, you can just get rid of it. The list goes on and on and on. It's actually quite easy to begin to believe a false word and allow these things to come into our lives and define our worldview and shape our theology. And that's why Paul urges us to hold fast to the true word of God that he preached. I love that. I love the clarity. I love the clarity. You know, Paul comes up and, hey, if you went to a desert island, you could only take one thing with you. What would you take? doesn't even hesitate takes their microphone and says, I would take the word of God. I would take the message of God's truth. I would take the gospel, drops a mic, and walks away. I love that. But did you know, I mean, these guys have been talking about the gospel a lot. Did you know that the gospel is not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? The gospel is not just New Testament. Did you know that the gospel starts in Genesis and ends in Revelation? Did you know that? The, the gospel is the entire story of what God has done. The gospel starts in a garden. It starts with God creating you and I, creating people for relationship. And, and then the gospel story continues on where we sin and we end up getting kicked out of the garden. But by Genesis chapter 3, God reveals an amazing plan. We're three chapters into his story and he reveals this amazing plan that he is going to buy us back and he's going to buy us back with the blood of his own son, with the sacrifice of his own son. It takes the entire Old Testament to get us there. And then by the time we hit Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the story of Jesus, we, we begin to get the idea of the gospel, but it continues on right through the book of Revelation. And if somebody walked up to you at work or at school or whatever and said, hey, what's, what's the story of the Bible? I don't get it. Well, what, what's the main story? Just tell me the, the theme of the Bible. Would you be able to tell the story? Most of us wouldn't. Most of us have these little pieces of Scripture all stuck in our head that we've been preached at, but we could not tell the concise story. And so over the next 31 weeks... We're going to get the story straight. We're going to work really hard to get the story straight. We bought a thousand of these, and these are ten bucks a piece. 
It's called the story. It's actual scripture, but it's not the whole scripture. It, it's it's the, the narrative of, of the story. It's, it's the Bible in 31 chapters instead of a thousand chapters, okay? 31 chapters. We're all going to go through it together. Here's the great thing about this. We've got a version for adults and for teenagers. We have a version for preschool. They have their own version of the story where they're going to be able to go along for 31 weeks in Riverwood Kids. They're going to be going with us as families. We have a, a chapter book available for school-age kids, that they're going to get the story straight uh, for 31 weeks. We're going to do this in small groups. Everything across the church is going to be getting the story straight. It's going to be amazing. Now, Pastor Mark's pretty tricky. He knows when to ask me for things. So I'm at the office. I'm on my way, on a mission. I'm on my way to the bathroom, okay? And he knows I'm going down the, the stairs. I'm on. And what does he do? He walks past me and says, hey, dude, I need 100 of those storybooks. I stopped, thought, okay, this can wait. Hang on, what do you mean you need 100 of these? Why? That's $1,000. He says, well, can you get me 100? I said, I don't know if I can get you 100 of these. What in the world would you even want 100 for? He says, well, here's the deal. We want to give one to every junior high and every senior high student in our ministry. We want to just give it to them free. They're, they don't have to pay for it. We just want to give it to them. I stopped for a moment. I thought, how profound is this? Can you imagine our grade sevens? our grade 9s, our grade 11s, our grade 12s, growing up. And some year, 20 years from now, saying, you know what? I had a youth pastor. Didn't ask me to buy it. I had a youth pastor who gave me the story. And I read through, I read through the entire story of the Bible when I was in grade 7, when I was in grade 8. It laid a foundation in my life. And I thought, okay, i got to find a way to do this. So last night at Saturday evening service, I told the story. And I said, yeah, he walked down the stairs and said, hey, dude, I need 100 of these books. And I said, I don't know where I'm going to get them. And I just told Saturday night, I don't know where we're going to get them, but we're going to get them. Somebody walks up to him at the end of the service and says, hey, I'll buy 100 of those. Boom, done, bought. We have 100 of them already for, for the students, which is awesome. So what we want to have happen next week on our book release weekend is we want everybody at Riverwood in all of our worship venues to be able to walk up to a table and just take a book. Not to swipe their card, not to give us $10. We want you to pay for it. We would love, we have $15,000 invested in this. We need you to pay for it. But we don't want people to, to feel like if they can't afford it, that they can't get one. So Carolyn and I, I've been telling you this for weeks, we're just going to buy 10. We're going to keep two. We're going to leave eight on the table. And for whoever can, can use a book, we just want to take care of it that way. I hope that we're going to have to go out and place a second order that we're going to need more than 1,000. Because here's the deal that I know. I know there's about 1,300 people that regular season come to Riverwood, you know, outside of the, the summer season. But here's what else I know. I know there's another, another 2,000 people who call Riverwood home, but they haven't been here in 12 weeks. They haven't been here in six months. They call it home, and they say, yeah, Riverwood's my church, but they don't come. For whatever reason, we know the statistics across the country say that people are going to church less and less. Here's what we need to do. We need to take the welcome home card, and we need to go find those people this week. We need to say, hey, you know what? You used to come. Why don't you carve out some time, and why don't you come to church? We're going to have, we got, we got five worship, uh, special worship leaders that are going to be coming in over the next two weekends. We're going to have a blast together. But we're starting something brand new. We're going to start, you know, you ever find the Bible confusing? We're going to start getting the story straight, and I, I, would, I want to give you one of these, and I would love for you to come with me. There may be somebody that does not know Christ that's just been wondering. Maybe it's on their bucket list to read the Bible. What a great opportunity. Church, I believe God wants to do phenomenal things over this next year. My faith is, is topped right up, and I'm so excited about it, and I hope you're with me. Would you stand? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how important it is. And thank you for this idea which blows my mind that we are being saved on a daily, continual basis if we hold fast to the Word of God, if we hold fast to the gospel message which started in Genesis and ends in Revelation. God, I pray that, that your blessing and anointing would be all over this. God, I pray that you'd help us to take care of this $15,000 bill so we don't have to worry about that. But more importantly, may we get the, the Word of God into the hands of of people. Thank you for these people, that are this person that, that, that bought all the Bibles for our youth already. What a gift. What an amazing thing we get to go into this school year with saying, here, let's read the Word of God together. That's powerful stuff. And God, I pray for small group leaders to rise up and take small group leaders uh, uh, starter kits next weekend. I pray, God, that you would do a revival ministry in our hearts. I pray for the 2,000 people that call this their church but don't come. God, help us to reach out to them first. 
And may you cause them to be just revitalized by the hope that is in you. We look at the world around us, there's no hope in this world. It is, is it getting crazier and worse. And God, I pray that, that the light of Jesus Christ would shine bright in each of our hearts. And the people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us this weekend. Have a great long weekend.